Now let's take an overall look at the charges involved in the accusation of betrayal. Formulating the problem in philosophical terms, we find that despite being considerably different and despite arising out of quite different ideological and political positions, these accusations share a vision of universalism which requires further examination. Driven by the need to counter and surpass the domestic egoism of the bourgeois family, which concentrates its attention exclusively on its restricted unit while avoiding the tragedies that unfold all around it, Kolontai calls upon communists to cultivate a universal sense of responsibility, moving past, even with regard to children, the distinction between yours and mine, struggling alongside others for that which is common to all, for that which is ours. We have seen Trotsky rightly point out the catastrophic consequences when parents ignore their particular responsibilities toward their own children, in other words, bypassing the responsibilities within the immediate family unit, without starting first from a particular and unavoidable responsibility, universal responsibility proves to be empty, and even becomes a tool to avoid responsibility. In this sense, according to Lenin, Kolontai's theory was antisocial. 356 But while they appreciated in relation to the family question, the Bolshevik leaders tend to forget the unity of the universal and the particular when confronting the national question. At the moment of its founding, the Third International starts from the assumption that a single party of the international proletariat is called upon to achieve the universal emancipation of humanity, without getting confused by so-called national interests. 357 We have seen Kolontai in a similar way theorize a type of universal family where mine and yours seamlessly dissolve into ours. Soon after, the Third International goes through a difficult learning process that would lead to Dimitrov's report before its Seventh Congress in 1935, which denounces any kind of national nihilism as dangerous. 358 But isn't the rediscovery of the nation a betrayal to internationalism? While for Kolontai the continuation of the family institution, and giving particular attention to one's own children, are synonymous with egotistical pettiness and disinterest for the welfare of all children, for Trotsky examining the perspectives of social revolution within the limits of a single nation means ceding to or indulging in social patriotism and social chauvinism, responsible among other things for the bloodbath of the First World War. Also. The idea of a socialist revolution that is carried out and completed in a single country is a point of view that is fundamentally national reformist, it is neither revolutionary nor internationalist. 359 These are statements from 1928, ten years later the Fourth International is founded, which takes up the abstract universalism from earlier, and therefore defines itself as the party of the World Socialist Revolution. It would be easy to use against Trotsky his own argument from the polemic against Kolontai, just as ignoring and avoiding personal responsibilities in relation to one's own kids and relatives doesn't represent a true overcoming of domestic responsibilities, neither is it synonymous with internationalism to lose sight of the fact that the concrete possibilities and tasks of revolutionary transformation are first centered in a determined national terrain. Distance and indifference to one's own country can certainly have a non-progressive meaning, in Tsarist Russia, Herzen, an author dear to Lenin, observed that the aristocracy was much more cosmopolitan than the revolution, far from having a national base, their dominion was rooted in the denial of the very possibility of a national base, in the deep division between the civilized classes and the peasantry, on one side a restricted elite inclined to behaving themselves as a superior race, and the immense majority of the population on the other.360 without eliminating the racialization of the subaltern classes, and without upholding the ideas of the nation and national responsibility, one isn't a revolutionary. Stalin understands this well, as the speech delivered on February 4, 1931 demonstrates. On this occasion, he presents himself as a revolutionary and internationalist leader, who is at the same time a statesman and Russian national leader, committed to resolving the problems that have held back the nation for some time. We Bolsheviks, who have carried out three revolutions, 
who have emerged victorious from a hard civil war, must also deal with the problem of overcoming Russia's traditional industrial backwardness and military weakness. In the past we had no nation, nor could we have won. 361 With the overthrow of the old regime and the arrival of Soviet power, national nihilism is more unwise than ever, the revolutionary cause is at the same time the cause of the nation. The emphasis now appears to shift from the class struggle to the construction of the national economy, but more precisely, in the concrete political situation that's been created, the class struggle becomes the task of achieving technological and economic development for the socialist country, putting it in the position of confronting the terrible challenge that's approaching, and offering a real contribution to the emancipatory and internationalist cause. The class struggle not only takes on a national dimension, but it appears to configure itself in Soviet Russia as a banal and routine task, in the period of reconstruction. Expertise decides everything, therefore, it is necessary to learn skills and become masters of science. In fact, this new task is no less difficult and demanding than the storming of the Winter Palace, we Bolsheviks must conquer science and become specialists, it's certainly not an easy objective to reach, but there's no fortress Bolsheviks can't storm. 362 The policy during the Great Patriotic War finds its first expression in the years when Soviet Russia is committed to a colossal endeavor of industrialization and reinforcing national defense. In the lead-up to Nazi aggression, we have seen Stalin stress the need link national sentiment and the idea of the nation to a healthy nationalism, correctly understood, with proletarian internationalism. In the concrete situation that arose following the Third Reich's expansionist offensive, universalism's advance passed through the concrete and individual struggles of the nations determined not to let themselves be reduced to slavery at the service of Hitler's master race, truly advancing internationalism was the resistance by nations most directly threatened by the Nazi Empire's program of enslavement. Just three years earlier, as confirmation of the fact that we are in the middle of a learning process that's encouraged or imposed by the concrete necessity of developing the struggles of national resistance against imperialism, Mao Zedong states, to separate the content of internationalism from its national form is the habit of those who don't understand anything about internationalism. With regards to us, however, we must closely link them together. Some of our worst errors were committed because of it and they must be corrected with the utmost dedication. 363 Gramsci similarly distinguishes between cosmopolitanism and an internationalism which knows, and in fact must know, how to be profoundly national as well. Aside from the rejection of the nuclear family and the theorization of a type of collective parenthood, at the general political level, abstract universalism is clearly seen in the proposal of a collective management seen once again as the dissolution of personal responsibilities and duties taken on individually. It's not a coincidence that Kolontai is for some time part of the workers' opposition, whose slogans at the factory level and in the workplaces of the party, and in union and state administration, are power to a collective organ, collective will, common deliberation, collective management. 364 The millenarian expectations for the disappearance of mine and yours again makes its appearance in the economic sphere, with the subsequent condemnation of more than just a determined system of production and distribution of wealth, but the condemnation of the money economy, the market as such, and private property, no matter how limited and restricted it may be. In all these cases, the universalism that's aspired to is that which immediately appears in its uncontaminated purity, without being mediated by or interlinked with particular concerns. It is this cult of abstract universalism which yells treason every time particularity has its rights or power recognized. 